Hi, I'm Brendan Storr. I'm the author of the new book, A Strange Little Place, The uh, Hauntings and Unexplained Events of One Small Town. Uh, the book is a chronicle of over 60 years of paranormal history here in Revelstoke, BC, uh, my hometown. And I'm here today to give you a short reading of a chapter called The Pass. And the chapter The Pass details a series of strange events which have happened in Rogers Pass over the course of the last, I believe the last 20 years. Of all the stories in this book, the one of the Rogers Pass Fireball was the hardest to research because those who actually witnessed the event are reluctant to even acknowledge it happened, let alone talk about it. The bulk of what I know comes from a man who wasn't present but heard about the event soon afterward. The man posted the eyewitness account to a UFO-themed website in the late 1990s, early 2000s, and was contacted by a researcher at the University of California who believed that the, what the man witnessed was the testing of an energy weapon, the design of which was based on the work of Serbian inventor Nikola Tesla. The two eyewitnesses I could locate were aware of this theory but disputed it because they believed what they saw was alive. The details in this chapter come from personal interviews with witnesses. The two eyewitnesses refused to provide any information as to the identity of the others who were present during this event, but I hope my keeping their confidence will encourage others to come forward. The story Missing Time is adapted from an anonymous account submitted to the website UFOBC, www.ufobc.ca. My efforts to identify and locate the person involved, whom I call Henry Talbot, have thus far been unsuccessful. Prior to 1882, the area now known as Rogers Pass, a steep avalanche-prone passage through the Selkirk Mountains some 40 miles east of Revelstoke, was largely unexplored. When, in 1881, the Canadian Pacific Railway decided to run tracks south through the Rocky Mountains, it became necessary to find a safe route through the treacherous terrain, and Major A.B. Rogers, an American railway location engineer, was chosen for the task. Rogers trekked through that unforgiving country the following year, plotting out a route that, while not risk-free, was the safest possible at the time. Construction on the line began in 1883. Opening in 1885, the newly christened Rogers Pass immediately became the most dangerous part of Canada's transcontinental railway. Between 1883 and 1911, the region's avalanches claimed more than 250 lives. Now to put that into perspective, since 1782, Canada has recorded a total of 702 avalanche-related fatalities. The section of the pass between Cheops Mountain and Avalanche Mountain is the infamous site of the deadliest avalanche in Canadian history and second deadliest in the history of North America, the 1910 Rogers Pass Avalanche, when a frozen section of mountains swept down from Avalanche Peak and buried 58 men under 30 feet of snow and ice. It is also here, in this remote place, where people have encountered some of the most frightening phenomena reported in the Revelstoke area. In the moments leading up to the Rogers Pass Fireball, there was no indication to the few present that this still winter night was different from any other. Temperatures hovered around freezing on the morning of December 18, 1997, as three two-man CPR crews, two aboard trains, and one headed home to Revelstoke in a taxi, watched the night sky erupt. Even some 15 years later, witnesses to the Rogers Pass Fireball were reluctant to discuss details of the incident. I haven't talked about it since it happened, says one man who refused to say anything else on the record, and I don't want to start now. What details have emerged tell of a booming sound followed by the appearance of an enormous yellow ball of light, crackling with what appeared to be electricity, streaking across the canyon. Says one source, all of a sudden the sky went like daylight, bright daylight, and this big yellow ball slowly went over the mountain. The fireball, which made no sound after its initial appearance, was then said to stop its progress and hover above the valley for ten full seconds before it finally disappearing behind Mount Sir Donald in the southeast. While in the broad strokes, the Rolstow fireball shares characteristics with ball eyes, particularly large and bright meteors entering the Earth's atmosphere, these typically disappear in a matter of seconds, whereas the Rolstow fireball endured for almost a full minute. Additionally, this is not the first time such a phenomenon has been reported. On March 9, 1957, a Pan Am flight bound from New York to San Juan, Puerto Rico, narrowly avoided collision with what was described as a big fireball, advancing with tremendous speed with a roaring sound. The reports of the Pan Am encounter do not suggest any kind of intelligence behind the sudden, mysterious conflagration, and other fireballs observed throughout history are often attributed to some as yet unknown feature of the natural world. Witnesses to the Revelstoke fireball are almost certain that there were more environmental factors at work. I don't know what it was, says another witness who claimed the light was so intense that other drivers on the highway began to swerve in shock, but I felt like it was looking at us. Though what follows is the only story of missing time to come out of the Revelstoke area, it is far from unique. Missing time episodes are a staple of paranormal lore, usually associated with the field of ufology. And 
and cited by true believers as proof of extraterrestrial abduction. While that may seem fantastical, the circumstances surrounding the episodes of missing time seem to defy all current understandings of time and space, making it understandable why the first explanation people reach for is literally out of this world. It begins with silence. While there have been reported instances of group missing time events, it is most common among those who are alone. The person, be they traveling or at home, experiences a momentary disorientation that observes that a significant amount of time has passed, anywhere from minutes to hours or, in extreme cases, days. Several things differentiate this from simple sleep, the first being that aside from disorientation and the feeling of returning, as though from a general anesthetic, the person experiences no fatigue, dreams, or any other sign of sleep. Second, the episodes often occur while subjects are in motion, driving, walking, etc., without any loss of motor control. Third, and perhaps most bizarrely, people who have experienced missing time also tend to wake up in different places than where their initial disorientation occurred. Some people even report waking to find they traveled a far greater distance than should have been possible given the amount of time elapsed during their fever. Those who have undergone episodes of lost time are often reluctant to discuss their experience and, while they may not dream during the event, it is extremely common to dream afterward. Often these dreams are not pleasant, as Henry Talbot would discover. When he left his golden BC home for Revelstoke on the night of October 5, 2002, Henry Talbot was no stranger to the winding 150 kilometer section of Highway 1 that connected the two towns via Rogers Pass. I left about 9 p.m. driving alone, he told UFO reporting site UFOBC. Having driven the route many times, and usually at night, I expected to arrive in Revelstoke before 10.30 p.m. The danger inherent in traversing Rogers Pass didn't end with the coming of the railroad. Even for those accustomed to the trip, since the highway's completion in 1962, there have been hundreds, if not thousands, of fatalities on its many curves and bends. One eight-kilometer section just outside of Golden is home to 36 curves, including the infamous school bus corner, where in 1990, a school bus crash killed two young girls and injured 28. As he set out that fall evening, Talbot knew that despite his familiarity, he would have to be careful on his journey west, and it is this heightened awareness that calls into question more mundane explanations of the following events. The first 20 to 30 minutes of Talbot's journey were uneventful. The weather had been mild over the last few days and the highway was bare. It is from this point on that the events take a strange turn. There is a point on the eastern side of Rogers Pass where, if you're heading west, the highway runs straight for a stretch and then takes a sweeping turn to the right, says Talbot. It then begins to climb toward the summit, passing through snow sheds, concrete tunnels built over highways to deflect avalanches, on the way up. As he approached the turn, Talbot observed what appeared to be the taillights of a semi-truck disappearing around the curve. Next thing I know, says Talbot, I feel like I'm lost. The road seems unfamiliar, level and even a little downhill, not the steep climb to Rogers Pass I was expecting to find around the corner. Disoriented, Talbot checked his dashboard clock. The car clock showed that it's a little before 11 p.m., and that makes me all the more confused. Then I passed a sign that says Rogersville was only a few kilometers away. Talbot was then able to place his location, but was at a loss to explain how, given the attention he had been paying to the road, he had traveled more than 100 kilometers without realizing it. I do not remember driving through any of the snow sheds on the way up or down, he says. How could I not remember even one of them? I don't remember driving through Rogers Pass Summit, where I'm normally very aware of road and weather conditions, not to mention the bright lights and speed zones. Initially, Talbot blamed fatigue for the gaps in his memory, but the explanation was an uneasy one. I said to myself, who hasn't driven a familiar route and not remembered parts of it, he explains. But I still wondered how I could have forgotten so much, almost the entire trip, and how, is, how it was I ended up going 30 minutes behind schedule. As he left Revelstoke Hotel the next morning, Talbot found his memory of the previous night's events as hazy as before, but the gaps bothered him less, at least consciously. I still felt like something about my trip wasn't right, but it seemed very distant, he says. For some reason, I also felt as though I would not be happy, I would be happy not having to travel that route again. In the years since that night, Talbot has done his best to abide by the mysterious feeling, taking that particular stretch of Highway 1 only once more in 2005. I traveled that road often, uh, pardon me, I traveled that road once more, with a passenger at midday, and kicked another traffic in sight at all times, he remembers. I felt very uneasy on the stretch of road below Rogers Pass. Though over the years he may have physically returned to Rogers Pass only once, Talbot has found himself mentally returning again and again to that night in 2002. I have often bad dreams about that trip, the parts of it that I remember, he says, as if I'm driving it over and over. One dream in particular has come to haunt him more than any other. In one dream, I watch the lights of the semi-truck ahead as they begin to go around the corner. Suddenly the lights reverse direction, and within a second or so, close the distance and fly over my car. 
I'm leaning forward in the driver's seat, craning my neck to look upward through the windshield, where I see a single large red light a few feet above my car. I'm suddenly filled with terror and feel like I can't breathe. I begin hyperventilating and trying to crawl for help, but only hoarse squeaking sounds. And I wake up. Though he's convinced, he's not convinced that his nightmare is any more than that, and he has no concrete explanation for his fear, Henry Talbot still cannot bear the thought of driving rebels to rivals pass again. I do not want to be on that road, he says, and I don't really understand why. And that's just one story of many, and uh, though it's the only case of missing time, in the book there are many more, from Sasquatch to ghost stories to gremlins, of all things. And uh, I encourage you to pick up a copy. Thank you for watching.